Welcome. It has just gone 7.20 p.m. Wednesday the 30th of March, and you are watching Regional RAP, episode 42. Regional RAP, providing an insight on the issues affecting regional Australia and giving a voice to regional residents. My name is Bill Bates. Joining me on this episode, The Great Divide, Driving Wedges Between Regions, is my guest, David Landini. David is the principal of a wool broking company, Landini in Industries. The company deals with wool growers, receiving their consignments and selling the wool at the Melbourne Wool Sales. Dealing with farmers as a small businessman in regional areas has caused David to recognise the disastrous standard of governments formulated by the power brokers residing in the UNSW Cabal Triangle of Newcastle, Sydney and Wollongong. Together with the detrimental effect of their decisions are having either directly or indirectly on the people of regional New South Wales. Identifying the political representation imbalance between the Carbell Triangle and regional New South Wales, David founded the Riverina State Party and is an active advocate for the separate Riverina State. Welcome, David. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Bill. I'm glad to be here. David, we were at this, doing this last year around about May with Tim Quilty. Yep. Um, Tim Quilty and the Liberal Democrats have got their own problems with their name, but uh, apparently they've convinced the Australia Electoral Commission to let them go this, uh, this, this coming federal election because uh, they haven't got enough time to change their, their stationery. Right. But they are changing their name to the Liberty, Liberty Democrats uh, after this election. Really? To meet with, uh, well, there was a change to the legislation, the electoral legislation last year, um, which basically put, put uh, all the parties on notice about the, what names they use. And also it increased the requirement for uh, political parties to have at least 1,500 members if they wanted to be registered as a political party. In the federal. So, so yeah. that, that was introduced late last year. Yeah. Um, what I'd like to talk about tonight, before we get on to the separate state issue, um, is, and, and the divide that I think has been created by the governments in Sydney and Brisbane in particular, is I just want to touch on the uh, floodplains harvesting uh, changes that are being put towards the parliament in New South Wales. Now, for most of the uninitiated, most people would think floodplain harvesting would be something to do with crops and you harvest crops off like rice or something like that. But that's not what it's about, is it? No, it's, uh, it's not like that. I, I can give you an explanation if you like, Bill, or, or if you want to explain it better, you, you're, you're most welcome. No, I'll let you, you go first. Well, the floodplain harvesting refers to uh, the action where rainfall falls on the floodplain. Now, normally it would eventually uh, drain into one of the major rivers and the river that's really under examination at the moment is the Darling River. So water that would normally naturally uh, fall as rain and then naturally drain, eventually drain into the Darling River and then go down the Darling River into the Murray River, then into Lake Alexandrina and then sometimes out to sea. That's the normal function that happens. Now, floodplain harvesting refers to the capture or the harvesting of that water before it flows into the Darling River. So the water falls as per natural. But rather than naturally eventually flow into the Darling River, uh, landowners capture that river via the various tributaries and dams and whatever else they may have and prevent that water going into the Darling River at, as it naturally would. So it's referred to as harvesting. I don't think harvesting is a very accurate name. It's a bit too associated with harvesting a crop. More like I think floodplain capture would be a better description. So the water's captured before it flows into the naturally drains into the Darling River. And it's referred to as uh, floodplain harvesting. And it's kept on farm rather than go into the river. I think they brought change, 
brought some changes in last year, but now they're reviewing it and because of a bit of an outcry. And the other thing that's happened, this it's really driven a wedge between the farmers on the Darling River and the farmers on the Murray. It certainly and, has, yep. And what's also happened, it's actually caused your local member down for uh, the state electorate of Murray yep. to actually resign from the Shooters and Fishers and Farmers Party um, because the adverse impacts of uh, support, the farmers and fishers were supporting the changes. Uh, yep. So which was damage was going to be damaging to her constituents. That's so right. She, so Helen Del Dalton was a, is a name, and yep. she's le left the fishers and farmers to be an independent. Yeah. Um, but of course, I think they, they've got the member of Orange's uh, Orange and also Barwin. Yeah. Uh, and the yeah. And Troy uh, Button. Yeah. Pardon? Uh, yeah, Phil Donato in Orange and. Uh, Roy Butler, sorry, from Barwon. Yeah. yeah, so Roy but Butler, because, because it's his electorate uh, yeah. that's going to benefit all from the legislation, he's he's supporting it. Yep. And so you've got, got two, two people representing regional constituents basically at loggerheads because of, of, of this, this change. Yeah. Uh, now... My understanding, most of the problem is caused because it's putting extra extra restrictions or cuts cuts of water on the on the farmers of the Murray River um, to That's use right. because they have to send so much water down to South Australia to keep yep. keep that false that man made lake down there. Yeah. As a freshwater lake at Lake, lake Alexandria. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. What are so these? Really, been... Yeah, we New South Wales and Victoria and Queensland have a uh, a three state agreement, a tri state agreement to ensure a minimum quantity of water to South Australia. And historically, uh, two thirds of that, I believe it's around two thirds of that water has been supplied by Victoria and the Murrumbidgee and the Murray systems and one third has historically been supplied by the Darling River. Now, uh, because of the flood, the, the, the theory is because of the, uh, the floodplain harvesting or the flood, the water capture before it flows into the Darling River, the Darling River uh, has over the last number of years supplied a lot less than the one third than it historically used to supply. Now, because the Darling River doesn't supply the quantity that it used to supply, and South Australia still has to be supplied with that quantity of water, it means that water has to be taken out of the Murrumbidgee system and the Murray system to make up for that shortfall out of the Darling. So water is taken off irrigators in the Murray and the Murrumbidgee systems to make up for that shortfall that doesn't come out of the Darling. And the shortfall, the some of the, irrig the irrigators here, the representative bodies claim, that they, the Darling doesn't supply its, its quantity that it used to supply because of the floodplain harvesting that's taking place in, uh, in Roy Butler's uh, electorate on the Darling. So the farmers here have to make up that shortfall out of, out of the Murray supply and the Murrumbidgee. So it, it, it has created a lot of problems. The agreement between uh, New South Wales, Victoria, and Queensland is—is is that the Murray D Darling Basin Agreement? Or? No, it's a, it's an agreement. It's actually, and look, I'm not actually sure if Queensland's actually in that agreement. It's referred to as the Tri-State Agreement, which means three states. So Queensland might not be in it, but I think uh, it was very soon after. Uh, I think it was 1912 where those three states worked out that okay, there's so much water. South Australia should get some water. And so they worked out a minimum quantity of water that South Australia uh, will be will have supplied every year. So that was back in 1912 that uh, that right, that tri-state agreement was made. Uh, and so it's now it's well and truly before the basin plan. Okay, so so it's binding basically. Uh, well, it's it's a, it's a well I don't know how binding it is, but it's a tri-state agreement, and it's I think it's quite reasonable. I mean, no state would dispute that. The, the terms, the normal terms are quite reasonable. Um, 
I'm not sure how binding it is, but it's an agreement that that uh, the growers here, the irrigators here don't have a dispute with the actual agreement itself, but they do have a dispute with the makeup of that water that is to go to South Australia. I suppose the other thing that's occurred too is since not that agreement was formulated, South yep. Australia has all also uh, corrupted the system in regards to uh, putting the barrages on Lake Alexandra to make it a fresh water lake to stop the tidal flow. They and, uh, and a lot of the emphasis uh, is we want that water flow there to keep that man-made lake fresh, which it, it never was in the first place. Prior, prior yep. to putting the barrages on, it was a, a tidal lake system with salt water in it and, it, and its natural environment was, was salt water. Um, yeah, and this whole no, ecosystem. Yeah. No doubt about that, Bill. Yeah, that's right. And the, and the other thing that's, that's happened is by making it a fresh water, it's also heightened the problem with European carp. <laughs> I yeah. don't think yeah. European carp go too well in salt water, but they, they love fresh water and they love mucking up the bottom of the uh, lakes and river systems. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're a pest, but South Australia seems intent on its Charlie carp, <laughs> carp fertilizer system of, of keeping keeping that industry going. Whereas yeah. I think I think most people in in uh, fishermen and people using the river would like to see the end of the uh, European carp totally. That's right. And and if the uh, if it was returned to its natural state, the uh, brackish water, the part sea water, the part fresh water would kill all those carp. The carp wouldn't be able to exist in Lake Alexandrina, and they're a noxious fish. European carp, and uh, it is a breeding ground for noxious carp. Charlie carp gets all its carp from there. They're a huge uh, fertiliser business, and they use carp as their fertiliser, and that's where they get them all from. So I think that's that's part of the problem too, is South Australia's had this comfortable agreement of getting water supply through the Darling and the Murray, and it's really they've really dropped the ball in regards to um, their own own water uh, system in regards to, I don't yeah. think they, I don't think they have a dam in South Australia, do they, or any yeah. sizable one? Yeah, look, Bill, look, I, look, you and I would agree entirely, um, but I can, I can assure you, if you talk to any South Australian, they will disagree vehemently. Uh, South Australians are generally militantly um, defensive about water. They're militantly. Um, they have, they're very militant in their attitude that that is their water and they deserve it. Um, so, and I've spoken to South Australians, they're very, very nice people, but when it comes to water, the whole thing just changes. And, uh, and you, you and I can put these things, you, you can make these points that are exactly right. Uh, but if you talk to South Australians, that, that just goes out the window. There, it's a different, it's a certainly different attitude in South Australia, which I disagree with, but it certainly is different. Uh, oh, I mean, it, it just takes the emphasis off it. Well, on their response to their state government's responsibility to deliver. It's, it's the state governments that are responsible for water. Yeah. And to me, this, the South Australian state government should be doing something to get more water into their own yeah. system, either dam the torrents or some other, other yeah. avenue of water. Yeah. Um, but relying on the rainfall in New South Wales and Victoria to be handed yeah. over. It's, and then we've got another problem coming up, especially for the people on the on the on the Murray, is Snowy 2.0. Uh, I'm not sure what the long-term ramifications of holding back or, or uh, that pumped hydro system is going to do to the actual uh, annual flow, because it's, it's they must have to be able to hold more, some more water back, uh, and every and in this day every drop counts. Yep. It, look, Bill, there's a real, uh, there's a real, uh, I think, a change in attitude that's happened over the last uh, number of years. Probably started as soon as the irrigation system here was put in, I think very soon after that, there was, there was, all, there, there was opposition uh, to that use of water for irrigation. Probably only a smaller opposition at, at that time, but it's really increased and really because of um, the large population centres are in the city, they're not in the country, they don't benefit from irrigation directly. Uh, they have this attitude that the water is, uh, it's an environmental 
asset or something along those lines and, and you must preserve the environment. Now, the environment to me is, of course, it's an illusion. It's not accurate, but it's, a, it's sort of just a, a fairy tale picture that they have of the environment. And there's this attitude mainly in the cities where the major population cent- most of the population is, is that water, uh, you've got to save the environment. And, and taking water out of the river is very unpopular with a lot of those, uh, those green type people and environmental type people. When I say environmental, uh, it's like we were discussing before, they're, they're not logical, but it is their delusion. So, and they're really attached to that delusion. That, that you shouldn't take water out of the river at all. Well, I think the Warragamba Dam blocks a river and we take, they take water out that to drink, so... Well, yeah, I, I mean to drink, but certainly not the large, like the large-scale irrigation. You know, they're much happier to see the water go into Lake Alexandrina. Uh, and, of course, the evaporation losses in Lake Alexandrina are huge. It's, a, it's estimated that the average is a million megalitres a year is just evaporated every year, just in evaporation. Now, when that was seawater or brackish water, it didn't really matter. But because they maintain that as a, as a freshwater lake now, that's a million megalitres of fresh water that evapor- just evaporates every year. And then if there's any excess water, they, ru- they want to run it out to sea. And they're much happier to see that happen than for water to, to be taken out and used to grow food, uh, cotton, all these good things that people eat and, and wear. Um, they're much, much happier to see the water flow out to sea. They've just, uh, that's just the attitude they've got, Bill, and I think it's a real problem. And South Australia, it's a real attitude in South Australia. Like, they're, they've shut down a lot of their own irrigators. Like, if you drive along the, uh, the Murray River in, the, in South Australia, there's a lot of old dairy farms along the flats, the low, the low points on the sides of the Murray River. There's a lot of old dairy farms there that are just now closed up that used to be there. But the, the South Australian government themselves uh, took the water off those farmers. That, that Maybe they compensated, I'm not sure. But those dairy farms are all shut now. There's no irrigation there. So South Australia has shut down their own, their own irrigation to a large extent. So they're not just picking on uh, people upstream. They've, they've, done, they've treated their own farm, their own irrigators, uh, well, I'd say terribly because they've shut them down. I think, I think the other thing is people don't seem to realise throughout history since civilization began... Uh, proper on the river Nile and that yep. you know, hu- humans have been inventive they've managed to uh, harvest harvest water uh, channel water uh, yep. and, and take it from uh, canals and that to irrigate land yep. uh, so th- th- that's 5,000 years ago and then you see things like the Romans I mean or or even before them people in uh, the Middle East or, or per- what is now Iraq and that they had aqued- aqueducts carrying yeah. water hundreds of kilometres. And I yeah. think the lo- longest one the Romans had, they, they diverted water for 400 and so, 450 odd kilometres to, to get water to Rome and other places. So yeah. it, it's something through mankind's history that we've been able to do yeah. and, and successfully. So yeah. it's, it becomes ridiculous when you try to stop that development in, in the first place it is it is ridiculous bill it's ridiculous and it's illogical it's irrational the reasoning and the uh the arguments they put up to support their case the people that want to run not touch the river it's it's not there there's no logic to support it but unfortunately it is a real a real attitude in a lot of people uh and and uh and if you look at like if you look at the elections, when they when elections are held, there are there's a particular party, the Greens Party. They are opposed to pretty well all water extraction. Uh, and they like in the, in the last New South Wales state election, there was four hundred and thirty five thousand people who voted number one for the Greens. Four hundred and thirty five thousand. There's only three hundred ninety eight thousand voters total in West in New South Wales west of the Great Dividing Range. So there's more voters in green voters who are opposed entirely, really entirely to all water extraction, than the total number of voters west of the Great Dividing Range in New South Wales. I think all regional, uh, region, all of regional Australia has the same problem with, uh, yep, in relation does. to uh, the one man, one vote system and, and the disproportion of number of seats around the capital cities versus the ones out in regionals. 
It areas. does. It does. But but the numbers that I gave you, Bill, that, that's that's before you get to seats and members of parliament. That's actual numbers of people who support. Uh, like if they, if you vote for the Greens, basically you support their policies, mm -hmm. and their policy is basically to have no water extraction from any of the rivers except for maybe a drinking water, but certainly not irrigation. And there's that many people that do support that uh, that do support that um, that opinion. I think the other thing is people don't people always look on humans as vandals to the, to the environment. The, but the, some people do for sure. Uh, well, the the not the ones who don't want develop and the, and the ones who are against water extraction. But this, but if you went to a place like Ceylon and, and looked at Ceylon, you'd say what a wonderful wetlands environment it has. Yeah. But it's not natural. The whole environment that was developed in Ceylon nearly two thousand years ago was by one was the result of the actions of one of the rulers who had the attitude: not one drop of water will go to the sea until we've used it at least once. Yep. And so they developed the, all their irrigation, their floodplains uh, and, and uh, farming and that based on, on that, that development. Yep. And everyone thinks, well, that's amazing and it's a good natural environment because, of course, all the land's not farmed. It's obviously the water's retained on the land for, you know, for the jungles and all the other natural environment as well. Yep. But, but the problem is, a lot of people don't understand that our river system, and especially in the north, are basically run on rush and dust. So yep, in the yep. northern Australia, where 80% of the rain on the mainland falls, we have a couple of months where the, river, where the rain belts down and we have the rivers flowing at a mighty rage. And within a few months after the, after the rains and everything, the flow, flow ebbs and, and for, for the, the season coming up to the next wet season, a lot of those rivers are dry, dry riverbeds in places. Yep. That's yep. a ridiculous situation. I mean, all in there, there should be dams to, to hold that flow, release it uh, so it can be used for agriculture and long to and full year round environmental flows. And Bill, and, and, Bill, and that was the attitude of the earlier uh, generation of Australians, that was exactly that attitude. And like even the Murray River, for example, like in summer, that regularly the, dried up. You still had your, your big bends in the river that still had water in them, but the, the, there was lots of the Murray, lengths of the Murray River that were just dry riverbed. There's lots of records of photos of the dry Murray Riverbed. And earlier generations of Australians recognised exactly what you said, and they built the Hume Weir, they built Dartmouth Weir, they built uh, the, uh, I can't remember the, the, the big one in Victoria near Mansfield. I can't remember it off the top of my head. But they built these uh, reservoirs back then and they used them to regulate the water flows. They captured it in the high flow uh, times. There was still plenty of water in the river, but they captured it. And then during the dry times, they still just regulated out of the river. So the towns and the industries along those rivers had that regular supply of water. So earlier generations of Australians had exactly that same that attitude built, and that was the that was the attitude that should be had, for sure. I think, I think the other thing is now we've we've started with this federal election. The federal government doesn't seem to be so sure about building dams. It's allocated, especially in Queensland, it's allocated uh, five point six billion towards the Hellgate Gate Dam. Um, but the problem is. That's that's a a, a pet project of uh, Bob Catter and his influence on the on the government at the moment because they need his vote has probably got that over the line. But whether it's the best spend spend of money, I'm not sure. I and I think there's better projects. And the other pro other project we've talked about over the over more than since the 30s is the Bradfield scheme, and it resurfaced. Uh, last state election up here, there was a talk about Brad, some variation of the Bradfield system. Yep. But one of, the, one of the big problems with the Bradfield system, because of the era that it was, it was um, proposed and the knowledge of Bradfield himself that he had, it was fairly limited in regards to the water assets of, of, of Queensland. 
And basically, most of the water is actually north of the Burdekin uh, in the Mitchell, uh, Flinders. Uh, there's another 40 to 50% of the rain, uh, the rainfall and, and the flow in that area that actually goes out in the, into the Gulf. Yep. Now, they've never looked at harvesting that as bringing it down uh, sort of in stages from all the way up the Mitchell River down to the Burdekin and then downwards. But we obviously, instead of quibbling about sharing the limited resource that we've got, yep. to me, the onus is on the federal government to get more water into the system. Yeah. End the, of story. Yeah. The, thing, the, the problem that I think would happen there, Bill, is even though the federal government's allocated that money, it, it's a Queensland government project to actually do if they want to. So I don't, I really, uh, this is only my opinion, but I doubt very much that the Queensland government would uh, would build that dam. Even, even if the federal government's made that money available, I doubt, I very much doubt that they would do that. That's only my opinion, but that's what yeah. I think. No, I'm of the similar opinion. There's nothing the Brisbane government's interested in developing uh, far north and uh, north Queensland. They're, yeah. they're not overly interested. Uh, they seem to come out with legislation that actually hinders our development yeah. rather enhance it. But here's the thing. After COVID, one of the most important things we need to do with a deficit that's been racked up the thing this federal government has to do is grow the pie. And the only way you can grow the pie is development of regional areas. Building a tunnel, a cross river tunnel in Brisbane for starting off at 5 billion, probably end up at 12 billion, yeah. or any other tunnel across the Sydney or wherever, it's not nation building and it doesn't grow the pie. Yeah. They, those things are actually long-term liabilities a yep. cross river rail tunnel, all right, it might cut a bit off the journey, but it, get, it leaves you with a, an, a, an asset that you have to maintain. And the worst thing about it, for all the people who travel that, that, that um, corridor, you are in generally, for any public transport system, you have to subsidize every tra traveler, every passenger, Every ticket is subsidised yeah. uh, by the taxpayer. Yeah. There's no, nothing in those projects that create wealth. Yeah, so, yeah. but that, that's right, Bill. But look, there's a lot of Australians that don't have that attitude. I mean, I agree with you entirely. Um, but what you're referring to is a responsible government. And to be quite frank, I really, uh, I don't think, I really don't think the federal government, whether it's Liberal uh, Coalition or Labor, I don't consider them responsible. But there's a lot of voters who do. And, if, and I assume Queensland, Queensland is very similar to New South Wales in that there's a, there's a centralised population around Brisbane. And if you look uh, into that centralised population, if you look at their voting profile, I think you'll find there's a significant green voting population in there as well. You've got a, uh, and like, for example, I, I said in, in New South Wales, you've got Newcastle, Sydney and Wollongong, like the 435 thousand green voters are mainly in Newcastle, Sydney and Wollongong and up on the north coast around Ballina and that. There's quite a few up there. But there's a large green voting population there. So that's the core of, 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 uh, population that will oppose exactly what you've said about dam uh, building. Like in New South Wales, there will not be another dam built in New South Wales because to do that, you've got to um, go against the desires of that large green voting portion but also you've got both the Liberal Party and the Labor Party. If they want to get elected in, in, in the metropolitan areas of New South Wales, they have to appeal to their own voter base, whether it's Liberal or Labor. But with Australia's preferential voting system, and I like I, I think the preferential voting system is good, but to get elected, you've not only got to appeal to your voter base, you've got to appeal to the voter base of the other electors uh, that will cast their preferential vote when their candidate is eliminated. So in most cases, the Green candidate is eliminated before both the Liberal and the Labor candidate. So therefore, those Green voters, their number two vote will go to either the Liberal or the Labor candidate. So both Liberal and Labor, particularly Labor, 
appeal not only to their own voter base, but also to that Green voter base. And, uh, and uh, Tony Burke, who is the member for Watson in Sydney, now he was the Shadow Water Minister for Labor. Now, he, he, he promotes the traditional Labor type values but he also says, if you vote, if Labor gets elected, and this is a Labor's electoral platform federally, if Labor gets elected, we'll take another 450 gigalitres out of the Murray-Darling Basin and we'll flow it into Lake Alexandra and keep that in a fake, uh, well, I was gonna say a fake freshwater environment, but he would say a natural freshwater environment. And nine years out of 10, we wanna keep that Murray mouth open so water flows out to sea. Now, the point we have to understand is he's not appealing to Labor voters when he says that thing. When he, when he when he when they have that platform, he's appealing for the to the second vote of the green voters. And if you look at uh, the last federal election, which I have in Tony Burke's own seat of Watson, after the green candidate was eliminated, uh, I think from memory it was eighty six percent of the green vote went to Tony Burke. After the uh, so after the green candidate was eliminated, uh, the those ballots were redistributed, and eighty five or eighty six percent went to Tony Burke because Tony Burke's appealed to the Green voter. He wants to save the Murray River and all this sort of stuff. So that's the problem we have with building dams or any of that sort of thing, like nation building and wealth creation. There's a large portion of the population that uh, either they don't know what they're on about or they don't want it full stop. Like they're, they're, they're opposed to the construction of any dams. And uh, in New South Wales or Victoria, I don't think you'd be able to, to build another dam. Queensland may be different, but I don't, I don't think Queensland would be any different either. Uh, somewhere along the line, it might get a matter of necessity because, you know, we keep yeah. trying to increase the population. So just on the Could drinking, water, drinking yeah. water alone, but to not understand that um, the wealth of the country uh, can be enhanced by farmers irrigating land and growing additional crops. Yep. is somewhat foolhardy. Yeah, I um, would agree. Yep. Look, just before we you know, shuffle off into another area, I'll just show up a screen of, of what we're talking about, at least in New South Wales. This, this is the 10 seats, basically. Yeah, of, there's only Bill. I think there's only eight, actually only eight, Bill. Uh, I, I, I counted them. They're there. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. No, it's only eight. Yeah, it's only eight. Only eight. Well, there. Yeah, I well, that's all. It's only eight. That's all. Yep. Okay. Why can't I count? I have to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right, Bill. Um, I suppose these are some of these other six. They'd count themselves as regional, but um. Yeah, not really, Bill. Like those ones up the top there, like uh, Ballina and that and Tweed, like they're a, they're a very green orientated population up there. And I yep. think one of those seats, either Tweed or Ballina, I think that's actually, they actually elected a green candidate to parliament. Uh, well, you've got problems. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. But, but this is the situation now. And you've got this because you've got a population of about eight and a half million people in New South Wales. And because they're all quite concentrated in that triangle of uh, Newcastle, Sydney, Wollongong. Sydney, yeah. and, and Wollongong, was that yeah. intentional? I mean, was Newcastle, Sydney, and Wollongong, we you know, somehow put there to, to match New South Wales or something? Well, you'd have to think. You'd have to think it was, Bill. You couldn't. You couldn't make that up, could you? <laughs> no, it's very, <laughs> very coincidental. Coincidental. Yeah. But, but the thing is, we've. We've got five, about 5.3 million people in Queensland and we've still got basically 20 regional seats. But yep. that, this is what our future in Queensland is going to look like once our population gets up to your current yep. situation in, uh, of eight, eight and a half million people. Yeah. We'll go yeah. the same way. And the trouble is for our regional leaders don't seem to be awake to that. they just drifting along and they'll gradually notice, oh, one uh, that seat's gone. Ne yep. Next, next, next um, redistribution. Another one goes. Yeah. But it's, it's a so it's a slow, insidious um, yeah. event. They don't seem to be taking any notice. Now, 
I don't yeah. think they. I don't think they actually. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure that they actually recognise it, Bill. I don't know if they can even see it. If they, I, it, maybe they've got to be told. No, I think I think they've been told enough. It was directly by myself and others. But yeah. but the other other thing is is too in the 2016 redistribution, uh, there was a proposal to reduce the regional seats from by two and add two in uh, the southeast Queensland. Yep. Bob, C uh, uh, Robbie Catter and uh, Shane Knuth were the representatives for the Catter party at that time. And they opposed that. And in the end, what happened, we, we kept our regional seats, but they added four. Yep, really. To, to southeast Queensland. Yep. And the problem is we're coming up for another redistribution in 2024 before the next state election. Now, we've added something like 350,000 voters. We lost your video. I, I'm not sure what happened there, Bill. I, I might have, um, I really hope my camera battery hasn't gone flat. Ah, uh, well, we'll, just, we'll just have to paint a picture, but we'll, we'll soldier on anyway with the audio. I've just turned it on and off. Um, that could be a little bit tricky. Uh, well, we'll, 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 we'll just insert a, a still photo of you, but you, yeah. we can keep, keep talking anyway. Um, the, the issue is coming to the next redistribution in 2024. Uh, there's got to be about another 150. Uh, 350,000 voters added to the list. Yep. That's, they will have to look at that. They will have to do a redistribution again uh, of some description. I mean, they can pump up the number of voters in each electorate, uh, which will do a little uh, padding. But yep. the trouble is, by putting up the number of voters in each seat, uh, if regional seats haven't kept pace with that, that growth, they will be in danger of not being able to have the uh, quota to keep their seat and, and the yep. boundaries will change anyway. That's right, Bill. Look, look, it, look unfortunately, it is, it's been an, uh, an, um, a continual process since, since 1904, when uh, in the first state election in New South Wales in 1900, sorry, the, yeah, yeah, sorry, the, uh, uh, the first election after Federation, like for example, in Barwon, which is for, now 47% of the area of New South Wales, now, back in 1904, there were six electorates and six members of parliament from that same area. And over time, uh, that because the population growth has been mainly in the city, Newcastle, Sydney, Wollongong, and electorates are based on equal population within, I think it's within 5% of the average. Uh, we, uh, Barwon had six members of parliament from that area, now there's one. But the country areas of New South Wales have lost one member of parliament every eight years, on average, every eight years. If you compare what there was in 1904, when the population was really much more evenly distributed throughout the state, um, that was the situation then. But over that 118 year period, on average, every eight years, one electorate, the country electorates continually get bigger and bigger and bigger gradually and the city electorates basically get uh, smaller and smaller or more electorates are included into that city area. So we lose one every eight years uh, on average. Now that map you showed before where there's eight electorates west of the Great Dividing Range. Now uh, there's eight electorates there. We continue to lose one every, uh, every eight years. I mean, there'll only be in 60 years, approximately, there'll only be one electorate on the current trend. There'll only be one electorate out of those eight, there'll only be one. There'll only be one member of parliament for the entire area west of the Great Dividing Range, based on the trend of the last 118 years, which is pretty a pretty convincing trend. And and I'm really sure Victoria is the same, and I'm really sure uh, Queensland uh, will be the same as well. Very similar, if not exactly the same. Well, my tip for the redistribution in 2024 yep. is the seat of collide will disappear uh, that seat although it it's counted in the central Queensland it actually to get the numbers it actually runs down to about 106 the most southern township is Bell which is only about 164 kilometers um, north 
northwest of Brisbane. So yep. that's how close that is reaching. So I'd expect that to be divided up to uh, Narango and other, other electorates. And the other one I'm tipping to go is either Hinchin Brook or Hill. Um, one of those two will disappear and the population voters are there will be redistributed to uh, either the alternative uh, area of Hill, uh, Hinchinbrook will go to Hill or Hill will go to Hinchinbrook, yeah. but they'll also divide, be divided up into Mulgrave and maybe yeah. uh, Townsville, yeah. uh, and the, and the bottom, the Townsville the, seats. The bottom line will be there'll be much more, there'll be an increased uh, urban metropolitan representation in the Queensland Parliament and a decreased regional area uh, representation in Parliament. And that includes even the biggest cities up around the north, like Cairns, Townsville and Mackay, they will, they, will, they will eventually lose all their representation as well, eventually. It, it, will, it, it will take longer, of course. It'll take a bit longer, but um, the, if you, assuming uh, Queensland is the same as New South Wales, and, it, and it's based on the same, uh, the same idea that electorates are based on equal population, a, relative, a fairly equal population within 5%, I would say, of the average. Uh, if that's, because it's got the same um, structure, the same, it will have the same, uh, the same, the same end result. You'll end up with bigger, bigger electorates in the country areas. And that includes the, the, the areas up around the North there, Mackay, Townsville and Cairns. And you'll end up like New South Wales, where 90% uh, of the uh, population and members of parliament will be in the southeast corner there. I think the other thing is, I think that's the way it's going to happen in 2024 because yep. I, I think the state government would be loath to put additional uh, seats in the parliament after the last, the last review added another four. We went from 89 to 94. Yep. I don't think they'd want to increase the number of seats uh, that early, I think they'll probably wait maybe another two or three um, uh, cycles for the redistribution yep. to actually increase the size of Parliament again. So the yep. emphasis will be on loss of regional seats That's to right. uh, and and uh, to to add the numbers into the southeast. And, the, and, the, and even if they add new electorates to the state, like add extra electorates to the state to stop the loss of country electorates it's like they did the other the other time they'll they'll bring in another two electorates but they'll be in the metropolitan area anyway which will still it will only it'll it'll still increase the the proportion of representation in the in the uh in that southeast corner part so you'll still have the same number of country electorates but you'll have another two in the southeast southeast portion yeah it still it's still, still distorts the, the, the distorts the balance but I suppose it makes people feel good that they've still got a local representative in, in their area, even though he's now now only one of 93 or eventually just one of 120. <laughs> and just another example, Bill, like uh, in my research, I found in Victoria uh, back in 1950, I think it was 1952, they, I assume they realised they recognised this same problem even back then. And I think at that stage, there was 25 country electorates in Victoria, but they were due to lose about four or five electorates because of uh, the equal population requirement for electorates and most of the population growth in the city. So they added in 1952, I think it was, Victoria added another 20 electorates to the Victorian parliament, uh, electorates and members of parliament to the Victorian parliament. But now that kept the same number of country seats. They didn't lose their four or five seats, but it put another 20 in the, in the urban area of um, Mornington Peninsula, Melbourne and Geelong. So even though the country areas were still there, the electorates are still there, the proportion of the country um, members of parliament declined, still that, that decline continued because there was an extra 20 added to the metropolitan area. So the metropolitan area still increased as a proportion. Well, basically, the influence of the regions in the political landscape is diminishing. It, it, it's, yeah, absolutely. Whether they, whether they, whether it's just the natural attrition as it happens at the moment, or whether that, whether they add extra seats, the diminishing uh, will uh, unfortunately will continue. Before we go on to um, addressing that situation and remedying it. Um, we're talking about division between or the dividing, uh, driving a wedge between regions. 
And the example we looked at was the floodplain harvesting. In Queensland, the thing that I noticed, because I'm not a Queenslander by birth, um, coming to North Queensland some 10 years ago, is the parochialism between the various major centres, um, what we call regional hubs, like far north Queensland, the regional hub uh, centre is Cairns, for northern Queensland, it's Townsville, the Mackay, uh, Isaac area, it's of course Mackay, and then central Queensland, it's Rockhampton. Now, there's always been competitive between Cairns and Townsville, of course, uh, and I'll stick to those examples. Now, that can be healthy uh, uh, competition and it makes, makes both strive. But however, when it gets uh, influenced by government favouritism or perceptions of favouritism, yep. either by, by different regulations that, that are brought in or just financial um, grants or, or, or infrastructure bills and that, it does kind of create a level of animosity um, between, and that, that's what we're seeing now at the moment. Uh, with cans, with our water security, we're sort of hanging by a thread if we don't get a new water system in here by 2025. Uh, and there's been no money, the state hasn't really shown any interest to do anything. Yeah. Whereas a lot of money has been spent in Townsville for additional pipelines. Uh, and the other thing, of course, that happens, of course, Townsville's got its brand new stadium for the Cowboys and they have <laughs> rugby matches there. And, <laughs> and Cairns is still walling around in a cow paddy, basically, at, uh, at Barlow Park. Uh, so, so you get this sort of friction uh, and that's not helpful. Yep. And do you have any sort of similar sort of comp, comp, competitions or competitive bases between different regional towns yeah. in, in New South Wales or are they they not so pronounced because they're basically population bases and as, as large as places like Townsville and Cairns where we're looking at about 150 to 180 people just in the general area anyway? Yeah, I don't think it's... Uh, there is there is a similar problem in New South Wales. Uh, I don't think it's as personal as that competition that you stated, like in between those different cities. But because uh, with government services, uh, that does create a problem. Uh, for example, uh, the Wagga has what's called the Wagga Base Hospital, and that's had a look, so many million dollar, oh, 100 million dollar uh, development added to the Wagga Base Hospital. And they've got all sorts of services and so forth in there in Wagga. Now that's great for around Wagga, but what's happened, the hospitals in the surrounding areas, and when I say surrounding areas, even out to Griffith and Daniloquin, people who are ill um, uh, with uh, whatever they may have, they, where they used to be treated in Daniloquin or Griffith, they're not treated in Daniloquin or, Daniloquin or Griffith now. They're put on the bus or the ambulance and sent to Wagga. So uh, the services uh, are taken out of those hospitals, of course, and then you have employment attached to those services. And there's a lot of that. Uh, that also gets taken out of the town as well and then basically trans translated into Wagga. So it's not a personal competition, but all the towns recognise it. And one of the most obvious ones is uh, childbirthing. Um, a lot of these smaller hospitals who used to have childbirthing where babies could be delivered in that local hospital, not a problem. Uh, a lot of the smaller hospitals uh, have, um, they don't deliver babies there anymore. They send them to one of the other hospitals. They used to have them in those towns, so they don't anymore. Now that's a, that might sound like a small thing, but it actually adds up because there's a lot of associated employment created with those government services that the government removes out of the smaller towns and, con and puts them into those, those bigger towns. And, and unfortunately, Bill, there's a reason for that is that, and it comes down to politics and politicians who want to get elected. Now, the first thing any politician does is look at where, where the votes are. Who's got the votes? Where are they? And they're always in the bigger town. So any politician that wants to get elected, he or she knows 
do they have to get the votes in those bigger towns? And the, and the most popular way to get votes in the bigger towns is to build another hospital or a university or a high school or some other government infrastructure in that town. And, they, and that brings a lot of employment into that town. It often takes employment out of the surrounding towns because that same government service uh, is either downgraded in the surrounding towns and, and uh, transported into the, the larger centre. So there's a reason for it. There's a reason, uh, there's a reason why the bigger towns get bigger in, in every electorate. Like every electorate normally has one major town. And if that's the case, which most of them are like that, the bigger town gets bigger because the government basically, basically spends the money there because that's where the votes are. Uh, and your smaller towns are basically left to hang out to dry. And that happens in every electorate. Which is uh, so that's I think that's the situation here more so than a, a personal type of um, competition. There's no like personal animosity, but but a lot of the people are concerned. Where like at Hay, the Hay Hospital or the Barham Hospital, they used to they delivered babies there since year dot. But over the last I think probably twenty years now, they, both those hospitals have lost their their uh, their baby delivery service, and expectant mothers are now transported to one of the other one of the other hospitals. <laughs> so, yeah. sometimes it ends up being born on the side of the road. But uh, that, 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 that's, that's, a, yeah. that's the same situation in Queensland uh, as uh, the concentration of services are in, in the large areas. But, but what it does it is it causes withering of the smaller townships. It does. Because once you take a service out like that, well, the people who were there providing that service had families, had children going to school, bought, bought things at the local shops and tyre service or whatever ever else was there. Yep. But you, you take two or three families out of some of those small towns that were providing that service, then all of a sudden you've got five or six kids less in the school. Yep. Uh, and then the amenity of the town doesn't, or the township doesn't seem that appealing to some people oh, yeah, either to right. come to. Or yeah, stay in, so yeah. they start retreating. That's right. It makes it. It makes a difference for sure. So, so they're they're, they're the real things that we need to, needs to be addressed. The whole point yeah, like, is, like I said, Bill, the problem is it's not an accident. Like it's by, it's caused by politicians. A lot of that is caused by politicians who want to get elected. They they look they look at the biggest centre and say, right, put the money into there because that's where the votes are, and they have to do that to get elected. But really, they have to do that. And it's really, it's a flawed, to me, it's a flawed, it's a fault in the system where it, where it, where it works, like, where it basically has to work like that. It's good if you're in one of the bigger towns, but if you're in the smaller towns, it's, it's no good at all. But, but the thing that's long-term is those bigger towns, the currently bigger towns, they're going to be threatened in the long-term if all the areas around them start folding up. Yeah, because sure. then what are they there to service if there's no farmers or nothing out there or whatever? So it, if you let it start withering at the ends, it's going to come back all along the vine until it gets to the root sort of thing. That's right. So, yeah. and like, and so, so, so you're got, going to have long-term damage if you keep going this way. Like, it, just for example, Bill, like uh, I've, uh, if the long-term trend continues, there'll be one electorate, one member of parliament west of the Great Dividing Range in New South Wales. That's all there'll be. And you'll have three major cities. There'll be Albury, Wagga and Dubbo. Now, when there's only one electorate, one member of parliament, only one of those cities will receive a lot of that government money. Like, and the other, the other cities, will they'll be left to hang out the dry too. Like Griffith, Griffith will be well and truly left to hang out the dry end, dried out well and truly before then, and a lot of the other towns as well. And eventually, even the bigger towns, they will be, when, when they're not the major town, and that will happen, they will also be left to hang out the dry. They'll just be left to wither, and they will. So it is a real problem, not just, not just for the smaller towns now, but for the bigger towns as well in the future. It will happen to them. So looking at the remedy, to me, there's only one remedy and it's something I've been sort of talking about for the last four years or so, and that's the creation of new regional states. I agree. Um, yeah. Now we've, it's, it's there in the constitution. Uh, it's, it's doable. 
Uh, although sometimes I think the people who wrote the constitution were having a bit of a bit of a lend of us going forward because before they wrote the constitution the separation of the colonies basically uh victoria and south australia and tasmania and queensland they were all part of new south wales that's right and there was no requirement to go through the colonial parliament of sydney it was a petition or action to um to England, uh, to the colonial department for seeking separation. And so you didn't have that hostile environment of um, the state state parliament or colonial parliament trying to yep. stop you. But when they wrote the constitution, they put it all in the hands of the state parliaments. Uh, so what you've got to do is you've got to convince the enough politicians in the parliament to sort of at least give you a referendum or something which yeah, was achieved right. and the only time it was achieved was in in 65 uh when the Askin government got in they had to uh provoke as a term of agreement between the then old country party with uh i think it was charles cutler was the leader of the country party is they had to give the people a, a referendum in in new england uh so it has been done before that didn't get over the line that referendum but there yep. again it was never going to get over the line if you got people in newcastle yep. and lake macquarie and people who had no affinity for yep. uh, new england uh yep. to vote for it yeah but but the people in new england they 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 had the right framework like they they, they followed the right process they uh they they agreed, they got the state government to agree to a, ref a referendum of the people in that area, not the whole of the state, just the New England area. Um, so if that referendum had have carried, the New South Wales Parliament would basically have been compelled or obligated to um, agree to the creation of that New England state back in 1965 or 67. And of, and of course, because, because Newcastle was included in that referendum, and in hindsight, it should, it, the, the the New England state people should have insisted that Newcastle not be included because uh, one third of the people in Newcastle supported the New England state, uh, two thirds didn't. But because Newcastle was by far the largest population centre, uh, even though the, the New England referendum was carried by up to 75% in some of those uh, areas up near the Queensland border, but in um, 75% of the people agreed with the, the, the formation of that state. Uh, they lost by, it was 46% to 54%, uh, but only because two thirds of the people in Newcastle said that they wanted, didn't want to separate into another state. And there was all sorts of skullduggery there as well, like the Sydney uh, government, and this was actually, this was a, they couldn't do this, but they threatened that they legally they couldn't do it, but they still threatened uh, the dairy farmers and so forth in the areas around Newcastle and North. They said, if you separate from New South Wales, we're not going to take your buy your milk in Sydney. Now that, of course, is prohibited by the Australian Constitution, but it really frightened a lot of uh, dairy dairy farm type people who said, wow, wow, we can't lose our Sydney market. So a number of people there close to Sydney said, no, we want to stay part of New South Wales. Otherwise, they're not going to buy our milk and that sort of stuff. So that was. Uh, that was a bit of cheating, actually, but that but that's what I think. I think some of the ballot boxes in Newcastle were as low as fifteen percent in favour. Um, yeah. Overall, I think yeah, it was on the average, yeah, on the average, it was thirty uh, percent yeah. for the whole of the Newcastle area. The, sorry, there was seventy percent didn't want to separate. Thirty percent did want to separate. I think I think the final figures were around about one hundred and sixty odd thousand. Four and 190 odd thousand against. Yeah, there was. So it, it was reasonably right. close, but again, if the line, if they had drawn a line border across just south of Tari at yeah. uh, latitude it would, 32, would have carried easily. They, they would have won one in a in a trot sort of yeah. thing. Uh, but historically, Riverina has also been in the mix, but back in uh, pre-Federation days and after that event, and of course Queensland. Uh, with central and north Queensland, uh, they they were chasing separation back in the as early as 1870. Uh, only 22 years after Queensland colony was founded, they were, New Rockhampton people were looking for a way out. Yeah. Uh, and then the last last big uh, petition to 
uh, Queen Victoria was in 1890, yep. uh, which would have formed the colony of central Queensland and north Queensland at the same time. But because Federation was coming on, it just got overtaken taken by events. But there was a, a good push behind that. Yep. Now, and of course, the Riverina had a big attempt back in the... Uh, uh, Victoria separated from New South Wales in 1851. And I think Queensland separated from New South Wales in 1858, I think. 59, yep. 59, was it? Yep. And the Riverina petitioned uh, the colony of New South Wales and the Queen Victoria in 1863 and 1865 to form a river state at that time as well. But uh, but the powers that be at the time didn't agree. I don't know why, but they didn't. Oh, I, I think I have, I've had read some of the sort of Hansards of the New South Wales Parliament at, at, at the time of separation of um, Queensland. And they were, they were most irate that they were going to lose all this, all this land and all, all, all the income. Yeah. And, and they're basically saying, well, what, 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 and this is, you know, basically what we've done for you, you know, yeah. we've, we've been supporting you all that time, but that was never true. I mean, very little, I mean, the, the colonial governments never provided much in the way of services uh, because, you know, there was hardly even a police force, let alone a, a hospital system or medical system or ambulance system. Uh, so in, yeah. in fact, the, the, the colonial governments were big on getting money in from settlers and things like that, but they weren't too good at putting money out there for infrastructure and service. And virtually no services anyway. They might have built roads and bridges, yeah. but they never, never provided anything for individuals, which is back, a lot different from today. Back, back when the Riverina attempted to separate in 1863, on the, on the, uh, the petition that they sent to the, um, the colonial government, they pointed out that to get from the Riverina to Sydney, they had to go down by Melbourne, get on the boat at Melbourne, uh, sail around the coast into Sydney. That was how they got to Sydney from the Riverina. So in the petition, they just pointed that out, that look, we are, really are separated from the um, from New South Wales, Newcastle, Sydney and Wollongong, which they certainly were. And that was just one of the examples they pointed out, which seems really strange, but that's how it was. Well, there, there was no Hume Highway and there was no well, real roads. So, they, <laughs> so, get, so, so it was a cat. It was a horse get the Great Dividing Range. Like the Great Dividing yeah. Range has got some pretty significant uh, cliffs and gull gullies and all that sort of stuff there. You can't you can't just go through the Great Dividing Range, not without a Hume well, Freeway. I'm pretty sure it wasn't even crossed the first time until about 1823. Anyway, the first time it was even crossed. I see. Yeah, let alone <laughs> any development that side of it. But just just before we wind up. Because uh, we've got a bit over it, I'll just just flick up a map. Um, this is this is my impression in regards to regional areas that would be suitable for new states, and you 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 can say yeah or no what I, what I've marked out for um, the Riverina. Uh, so here we go. Now, <laughs> this this is my my little version of what probably should happen. Uh, all the number ones is basically north. North Queens, Northern Queensland, uh, Northern Queensland state comprising of Central and North Queensland. Yeah. The number twos sort of running is the, is the Murray Darling sort of system. Yeah, the basin. All, the, the basin running yeah. all the way down and you, and you, and your port should be um, Portland. I think no, yeah, Portland's a big port. And yeah, so it includes all, all those people down there, all those, all those um, electorates or, and uh, local government councils. Yeah, just on that, just on that, Bill. You mentioned Portland. Yep. Uh, that area of Victoria actually wanted to separate from. Um, I'm not sure if it was Victoria or New South Wales at the time, but they actually wanted a separate colony of their own as well. In in the past, that area down there. So, and then I've got this other number. This number four here. That's sort of Eden Monero running into the. Uh, eastern yeah. section of the river of the Riverina, I suppose. But I suppose you're 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 looking at more along the Murray itself as Riverina, yeah, just, the, just more the traditional Riverina area, which is basically um, uh, slightly east of Albury, right through to the South Australian border. Like the Riverina is a historically mm. uh, recognised area. Um, it's it's always been the Riverina. If you drive through Wagga or you drive through Albury or pretty well any town in the Riverina, there's always 
a number of businesses called Riverina this or Riverina that or whatever. Like it, it's it is a rec, it's a historically recognised area. Um, the, it, what I'm looking at here is trying to get the sort of similar population bases in each yeah. section, sort yeah. of um, yeah. because because yeah. that's a fair, yeah. fairly fairly common basin areas there. Yeah, because north, northern New South Wales is pretty sparse. Up in this Queensland area is pretty sparse. Yeah. Uh, or as population, so you you need a good chunk of that, and it's always good to have a seaport anyway. But the other area historically too is the old New England area. But uh, yeah. you, to get it get close to a reasonable population where you might get as many as five federal seats, which I think is a necessity in a separate state. Uh, so you've got an argument to get a full suite of uh, senators. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, you end up like uh, ATC, and that you might might become a territory and you only get two senators or something like that. Yeah. The, in, in the Australian Constitution, they've, they've provided for that. Like when Australia was federated, every every state or every colony at the time, Tasmania, West Australia, New South Wales, they were all allocated 12 senators each. So because so the smaller states knew if they, without that, they would be dominated by the bigger states of New South Wales and Victoria. Mm -hmm. So they all had equal numbers. So, but when they provided for the creation of new states in the, in the constitution, I can't remember the uh, the number. I think it's section one hundred and twenty five or one hundred and twenty six. But they do say that if the new state is created, the federal parliament has the authority to allocate a, any number of senators to that state. So it might be two, it might be twelve, but it's what what, what it what it what it says not, it's not to, essentially twelve. No, what what they say is I think that uh, has the right to determine the representation and. Yeah, that, that is true to a degree, but it's not true for the lower house. No, the lower house is the lower house is is on a population quota. Equal, equal population. That's yeah, right. So, so it completely depends on on the number of residents, right. not voters, but the residents. Uh, a population yeah. quota is simply residents, not voters. Uh, and within a state, what happens is voters you divide electorates to get the even number of voters, but yeah. the number of federal seats. Is just based on dividing the total population of Australia by 144 or something like that. I think it is, yeah, and that's a, uh, that's a population quota. Yeah, that's the population for the House of Representatives. Yeah, yeah. 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 So and so the federal government hasn't got any say in that. That's just uh, a, that's that's, that's just population. just something for every for every electorate. That's yeah. right. Yeah, the, the AEC, AEC Australian Electoral Commission will make make that determination. The federal yeah. government, of course, can decide on the number of, of senators. That's right. And and, uh, and then unless you've got that minimum of five seats, I you know, I think you'd be hard pressed for them to give you a full suite of senators. And oh and no, you you wouldn't. No, you you'd, you'd have to have at least the population of Tasmania. If you had under yeah. the population of Tasmania, you could you could accept that they could limit you a bit. Mm. But if the Riverina, for example, had the same population as Tasmania. I would insist on 12 senators, same as Tasmania. I think you'd have a good argument going to the High Court, but I would expect to have to go to High Court to... Yeah, be it. Because they're not going to come up with that willingly. <laughs> oh, because New, like New South Wales and Victoria, they'll, they'll jump up and down and complain, and I'll say, no, that's you, it's too much representation. <laughs> but then I would not, say... Not, well, not to mention... It's the same as Tasmania, so... Not, not to say Tasmania would be the worst. They'd be the most... most the ones that have their nose most out of joint if there was new states. Yeah. Well, Tasm I think Tasmania is the smallest state per population. Uh, I think they've got about 600,000 voters, I think. Mm, uh, no, no, they've only got a total population of 530 people. Uh, well, 530,000. They've only got 400,000 voters. Yeah, so, they're, they're only... Their um, electorates, uh, the largest electorate is about 70-odd thousand compared to a mainland state. Where I think our worst situation is about 132 really? thousand elect uh, voters. Uh, there's a real big disproportion there. But yeah. again, you've got to respect Tasmania's position in regards to as a founding state. It was guaranteed those minimum of five it, seats. It, it would not. It wouldn't. It would not have joined Australia without that. Uh, that those sen that, that equal number of senators. It would not have. Wouldn't have joined the federation. And it wouldn't have done it with it without the guarantee of the minimum of five seats. Oh right, I didn't know that. I yeah, didn't, both I, West got a minimum of five seats. I didn't yeah. realise that. Yeah, both West Australia, which were very lowly populated at the time of federation, I yeah. think, 
uh, West Australia only had a population just over a hundred odd thousand. That was guaranteed to get it into the Federation was guaranteed, of course, the num same number of senators because it was a founding state, but it was also guaranteed a minimum of the five uh, House of Representatives seats. But of course, West, West Australia has gone on to be a greater population uh, based state and a uh, well developed state. I think it now has 10 or 12 federal seats based on its population. Yep. But if one of the biggest problems with Tasmania, they are cruising. I think the thing is we need to put the screws on them a little bit to be a bit more uh, progressive and not dependent on the Commonwealth taxpayer. Oh, of... it's, you've got you, Tasmania, South Australia, um, and every state, Northern Territory, they're not a state, of course, but no. every every state, in my opinion, just like you said there, they're too, far too keen to get on the public um, the public welfare role, and uh, and the money's there, so they take it, and really, I think that's a thing that should be looked at. I, I think with Tasmania's situation is uh, really distorted because I think employment-wise, seventy percent of the population of the working population is either employed by one of the free levels of government or is a contractor or has contracts yep. with one of those levels of government. Yep. Uh, now in regional Queensland, you know, it's all small business and, and farmers because farmers are small business. That's, that's, it's not the public service. If anything, a lot of the public servants that provide, you know, look after, administrate northern central Queensland are actually sitting in in uh, Brisbane and adding to their uh, local uh, economy, not in ours. Uh, so, see, that's, that's another thing that's a big boost for new states too, is although a lot of people whinge about, well, you'll have to just have more public service. But the thing is, they're your public servants. They're living your, in your area. They're going to spend their wages in yep. your towns and cities. So yep. you're going to, be, going to be a major beneficiary. Your region's going to be a major beneficiary from that. That's right. It's not, it's not, a, not, not a detriment. It's no. an actual plus. But, but to go back a step there, Bill, back to Tasmania too, back in their defence to some degree, like ta the Tasmanian government back in, I think, the 70s, they wanted to build uh, the Lake Petter or on the Gordon River, I think it was. Yeah. And that was, a, that was a real great bit of interest. The, the Franklin right? Dam. Franklin, Franklin River. Dam, and that would have increased the wealth production in ta Tasmania. And of course, the Australian federal government said, you can't do that. So, you know, that's, uh, I do bat on, on the Tasmanians for half there a little bit. They, they were actually scuttled by the Australian federal government on that one. Oh, well, and, scuttled by environment. Motivated yes. by the green vote, like trying to yeah. appeal to the green voters again. But, and to go back to the other thing about the public servants bill, the main thing uh, that a river interstate is needed is not so much uh, the public servants and the public uh, the services provided by the government. It's to enable the people in the river arena to create their own wealth, to earn their own living. And for example, with water, the states have authority over the water in their in their state. Now, the river arena would certainly use the water much more. Uh, there'd be a lot more water available for irrigation. The wealth production would just boom in the Riverina if it was under a Riverina government. So the, the angle I'm coming at is not government services or government bureaucrats. Uh, I would try to keep them to a minimum myself, but yeah. it's mainly to increase the wealth production and, and the genuine prosperity of the people in the Riverina. Well, I suppose the thing is also, you're getting rid of those restrictions that those uh, far away uh, Sydney and Brisbane governments impose yeah, on sure. regional Queens, Queensland and regional New South Wales with well, their... Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the biggest restriction is they're taking the water out. You're not allowed to use the water. I mean, water creates a lot of wealth. And the biggest restriction is that people in the farmers in the Riverina, and that wealth flows throughout the whole economy, the whole, all the people in the Riverina. But the biggest restriction is you're not allowed to take that water. And, and when the Labor government eventually get re-elected, which they will, they're going to take another 450 gigalitres, and that's a lot of water. They will take another 450 gigalitres out of the system. Most of that out of the Riverina. So um, that 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 
we have to do whatever we can to stop that. Well, so what we've got to do is wake up the people in regional New South Wales and regional Queensland yeah, and sure. regional Australia in general and say, look, stop stop letting these people run your lives. You need to run it yourselves. And, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And you need to do it. You need to get behind uh, those movements that uh, are looking at a se separate state in, in regional That's regional right. Yeah, and, just, and it really is a case of just educating people because if you look at the numbers, like I've, I've looked at the numbers and I've done up a little booklet that I have, which I show people, and it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. It's not very difficult to understand. But when you look at the numbers, the concentration of uh, population, politicians, political power in Newcastle, Sydney, and Wollongong, in Wollongong, and then you look further into that, the huge green voting population in there, um, and then the fact we lose one member of parliament every eight years, it's, it's, a, it's a lay down case, it's all over. And most, the vast majority of people look at it and say, mate, we've got to get out of here. Once it's explained to them, just say, well, and, the, and it's, the consensus is once they're, once they're educated, once they learn what the situation is, it's, yep, we have to get out. I think but, another, another important thing is too, somewhere in the, in the scheme of things, we've got to make sure that uh, these state governments aren't, don't drive a wedge in between different areas of the regions. And, and that yep. floodplain harvesting is, I see as a major problem at the moment and it needs to be it, sorted out in a hurry. It certainly has, yeah. Yep. It certainly has, Bill. And look, there's disagreement on that. Like uh, there are irrigators here who are adamant that that floodplain harvesting is, happens and is very uh, destructive to the whole irrigation system. But the people up north say, no, it's not. So there's a real disagreement about what's, what's actually true as far as um, how much floodplain harvesting occurs or whether it occurs at all. So, uh, but there's certainly some, uh, um, a difference of opinion for sure. And that still all boils down is to keeping an artificial man-made freshwater lake in, in that state when it should never never be in that state at all well good point bill it's actually yeah the real target is being disguised um yeah instead of mm -hmm. attacking the real enemy uh where uh yeah there's been a wedge driven there where the where the who, people who should be allies are actually having a dispute amongst themselves <laughs> well see that that's the cunning part of these devils in that that triangle of terror of, yeah. of New, newcastle sydney and wollongong so uh, we need to get over that. But I think probably the first thing that should happen, there should be a shorty over to uh, the barrages on, on uh, the Murray down near Lake Alexander and give, give them a few sticks of dynamite to, to get, them out, get them out of the way. It's been mentioned, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, actually, we're going to better not take that line. No, we probably cut that we, conversation we, a bit short. Yeah. <laughs> but, but still, I mean, it is sort of a problem when an artificial system like that becomes uh, the be all and end all of uh, an environment. And that's the trouble. These people who have pushed the environment you know, are, are actually prepared to sac sac uh, sacrifice the natural environment. Yep. I mean, there's a lot of problems along the Murray about the. Baramaga choke and things like that, uh, that they're not addressing, yet they'll, they'll happily, for some reason, keep this artificial system going. Yep, full of noxious uh, European car. <laughs> exactly right, Bill. It's, it's, it's bizarre. It really is bizarre. Well, we've, we've done our time. Uh, it's been great chatting to you. Um, I'm sure we'll, we'll catch up if you just stay on air before I... Uh, I'll yeah. wind up. Thank you, Bill. And I must apologise for my, it is my camera battery. The battery went flat. So uh, <laughs> my apology for that. Oh, well, we'll, we'll have, to, have to sort that one out before next time. Um, but again, thanks very much. And I'll just wrap up the show now. My, thank you, Bill. My pleasure. If you enjoyed tonight's show, please like, follow and subscribe to our Facebook page and subscribe to our U YouTube channel. Hopefully next week, I'll have Neil, Dr. Neil Burrows on. He's an expert in bushfires and the natural environment, and he'll be talking about the fire season from hell, the 2019-20 the fire season that saw great swathes of the eastern states uh, decimated by fires, and he'll give his impression in regards to some of the causes and also some of the findings uh, of those inquiries. So join me again next week. Thanks very much.